All right, so on that last one in OpenStax, we had a problem that looked like this. You had like a, a table, and it, it did something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that the time up here was, it was given, it was like three seconds, I think, right? Okay. That's right. And it gave you this angle. I forget what the angle was. It doesn't matter. It was some angle given, and it gave you the initial velocity, right? So you have all those, and it just wants to know what is the x and what is the y position at this point. So since you have the time, that's what makes this so straightforward, that you want to find the x value. You say it's v naught x. Remember, that's v naught cosine theta times t plus one-half ax times t squared. Uh, although here, ax is always equal to zero, so I just leave off that term. And then to find out the y, you say that it's v naught y times t plus one-half ay times t squared. And remember in OpenStax that this is uh, minus 9.8 meters per second squared, that we use 10. You put in the times here is three seconds, three seconds. You put in your V naught Y. Remember, this is V naught sine of theta. And then this is V naught cosine theta. And it will give you the X and Y position. So as I said, we, we worked a problem. If you go back, you can see where we worked that problem. I think I just sort of made it up on the fly, where you find what is the X and Y position at that time. OK, does that help? Yeah. yeah. All right. Any others? Courtney? Can you again, Diana, can I again see number, please? It was like a, like a basic one, but I can't work it out. Okay. Or like, what it went to. Why don't I, I'm not going to work it, but why don't I work a problem like it? Okay. Is that okay? Because yeah. that, that's, that's a good problem for, uh, for what we'll do on the test. Um, so I think that was number two. Number two was a typical problem where you're given the angle and the V-naught, so I'm told that V-naught, and again, I'm just going to make up some values here. Let's say that V-naught is 20 meters per second, and I'm at an angle of, say, 60 degrees, and I want to know what is the X range. I think it was asking for X. And what you do, and I can look at your work in particular if you want, because I expect that you did it this way. I accept, yeah, I set it up just like mm -hmm. that. I have the theta and v naught as 330. Okay. And then I knew I was looking for x. Yeah. So it's I think that you probably know how it works, but I'll look at your work in just a bit. But in short, what we do, or not in short, we'll do the whole thing, is I want to know what is the time at the top first. And I do that by saying that v top in the y direction is equal to zero. Now we know that the velocity at the top is not actually zero, only in the y direction, because we know that we still have an x component of the velocity. That never goes away. So using this information to find the time, we say v top in the y direction is equal to v naught y uh, plus a y times t. And this is t top. And then we would solve this for t top. So V top Y is 0 equals 20 cosine of 60 minus 10 times T top. And we would solve that for T top. So this is uh, 0 equals 10 minus 10 T top. So this time at the top of the trajectory is one second. You shall have a problem like this. Emma? Why is it cosine and not sine? Because I'm wrong. All right. Yeah, so this should be sine. And so this is not 10. This is 17. And so this is going to be not 1, but 1.7 seconds. Thank you. 
So when would you use cosine and sinusine? Where is it? You never use cosine when you're looking when you're doing this. The cosine is only for the x component of the velocity. And here you wouldn't need the x component of the velocity because we're we're only analyzing the y motion. How you think of projectile motion as two separate problems. One in the x direction and one in the y direction. And here we're just answering this problem as how much time does it take to go up and then come back down again. We're not even considering the lateral motion, the horizontal motion. All right? So you only use the cosine when you're dealing with the x component of the velocity, not in this case. Does that answer your question? Ross, do you have a question? No. Okay. So um, get back on here. Now we want to know, well, if I was asking you what is the y range, if I was asking you this, then I would use this time. But that's not what I'm asking. We're asking for the x range. And I know that x is equal to vx times t. That's the position right here. And so that's going to be 20 cosine of 60 times t, which is going to be 3.4 seconds. That's twice 1.7. The same amount of time to go up and come down again. And so that's equal to uh, 34 meters. So, Courtney, I think that you probably did it that way. But let's take, if you didn't, we'll take a look at your work afterwards. Okay? You with me on this? Yeah. We'll be on the test, okay? Absolutely, we'll have a problem like this on the test. No doubt. I'll either ask you the X or the Y range. So make sure that that's a problem you get right, for sure. And make sure that you can do it quickly. Uh, a, min a couple minutes, you need to be able to do it. Time yourself. All right. Yeah. How do you know when you're not equal to not x or something? Uh-huh. It's always equal in the x direction, ax is equal to 0. And so um, when we look at this equation, vx equals v naught x plus ax t. Right, that's one of our kinematics equations. If ax is equal to zero, that means this whole term goes away. So vx is always equal to v naught x. I think that's the question you're asking, yeah. right? What, what's vx? That's like at the end of velocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I'm looking at a trajectory like this, v naught x is the velocity right here. And Vx is the velocity in the x direction at any other time. So all it's saying is that this vector doesn't change because the acceleration is zero. That Vx is always equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. It's the velocity of the whole mm -hmm. in the x direction. Right. It's the, right. In the y direction, it does this thing where it starts out big, gets small, zero, then big in the negative direction. Those are good conceptual questions, too. You'll not only have calculation questions, but you'll have conceptual questions that will you know, assess whether or not you understand how the velocity changes, how these two x and y components are, how they respond in time. They're not interrelated, right? The x and the y, they're sort of separate from one another. Now, that's not entirely true, because if it goes up higher, that gives it more time in the air and potentially can allow it to go further in the x direction. So they are related, but you treat them separately. You understand what I said, just said there? That the y motion, if it goes up higher, that means that it's in the air for a longer amount of time. But it's a trade-off, right? Because when you go up higher, that means that your angle is bigger, so your x component of the velocity is smaller, so it might travel less distance in the x direction. If I won't understand. It. Yeah. All right. Um, any other particular questions? We can look through the old test and look for some example problems to work through. Or um, let, let's do the ones in your book. I'm not sure which ones we've done. But if there are particular questions, we can certainly address those too. I don't think we've done any of the projectile motion problems, actually, have we? Yeah, let's look at these. 
Because these are good ones, and y'all y'all have them in front of you, or probably do. Oh, I got a bonus question on this one. What was that one? I should give a bonus question. Oh, look at that. A bonus question. Would y'all like that? A bonus question? I'm not sure. I think that would <laughs> I forgot I've done that. I don't usually do that. Okay. Looks like a lot of the calculation problems are here, but then we can look at some of the others. Look, this is that one that I promised you. This is a number two is typical problem. I'm not going to work through it unless you really want a strong desire to. But this problem, and I'm asking for what is the Y range? It's a lot like the problem we just worked. Where you have to figure out what is the time at the top. It's in the book, yeah. It's on page 242, but I don't think you have page numbers back there. Um, in the back, 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 yeah. It's exam two. You find the time at the top, and then you say y is equal to v naught t plus one half a t squared. Alrighty. Uh, what's the answer to number one? I have a projectile that's fired at 25 degrees above the horizontal. Um, the highest point in its trajectory, its speed is 100 meters per second. If the air resistance is ignored, the initial velocity had a horizontal component of what? Not the answer would be there. Read it carefully. Any ideas? I hear C, I hear B, I hear what else? D. Oh man, no. It is a what? E. Oh man, no. Try again. A. <laughs> Look, the key phrase here is that at the highest point in its trajectory, its speed is 100 meters per second. That means that up here, the speed is 100 meters per second. Because remember, at the top of the trajectory, there's no velocity in the y direction. And that means that all of that speed at the top of its trajectory is in the x direction. That means that over here, it's also 100 meters per second. So the answer is A. That's a good conceptual question. It's in the x direction. What it, it has a horizontal component. Is this a full, if you were asking vertical, then you would have to... Uh, you couldn't figure out the vertical from this. Oh, you know, you could. Oh, that would be, that would be tricky. Oh, no. Yeah, so yeah, you could. So, uh, if the angle, let's do that. If the angle is 25 degrees... Yeah, this is a good question. So if the angle is 25 degrees, that means that 100 is equal to V naught times cosine of 25 degrees, right? Because the X component is 100 meters per second, V naught times cosine of 25. So V naught is 100 divided by cosine of 25. which is 110 meters per second. And then if I want to know V naught Y, it's 110 times sine of 25. Oh, I get 46. So that would be the Y component. And I know, you know, you would look at that and you say, gosh, that's a lot different than any problem that we work. And it is, but it still uses the same principles and even the same equations. But you got to know it. Like, you can't just know those two or three problems that we worked and then be able to do a problem like that. Yeah, Justin? I was reading question number two. Mm -hmm. It seems familiar. It's on page 66 in this book. Number two. Yeah, yeah it was it, probably. It's from <coughs> Yeah. It's the exact same question. Right, well. Numbers two. 
Yeah, so you'll see questions. Uh, you probably won't see a question with the same numbers as what we've seen. I might have even pulled it from this exam part, the, the practice. The questions we do in class are from exams. I don't know if y'all recognize that. So if you really wanted to be cool, uh, you could go through and figure out all the answers, like search through all the exams and find all the questions that I asked before class, and then you would always get the clicker questions, right? But it's not really worth all that trouble. Just work them in class. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's look at this. This is a, a good question, too. A spring-loaded gun shoots the ball in the horizontal direction. The ball travels 3 meters from a height of 20 meters. What is its initial velocity? So we work problems that are similar to this before, but it's still a little bit different. Have a ball, it follows this trajectory. It's that kind of problem. Remember, there are several classes of problems, and this is one of them. And the height is 20 meters, and it travels a distance of 3 meters. And I want to know what is its initial velocity. I need to recognize that all of that initial velocity is in the x direction. There is no y component. And the reason for that is that the angle is 0 degrees. And the cosine of 0 is 1. The sine of 0 degrees is 0. So there's only an x component. My first task will be to find the time. To do that, I say that y is equal to v naught y times t plus 1 half a y t squared. V naught y is 0, so that whole term goes away. Y is negative 20. That's this. Negative, because we're starting at 0, dropping 20 meters. Is equal to negative 10, t squared. So t is root 2, which is 1 wait, point. Shouldn't it, be, wait, shouldn't it be 5? Negative 5. Oh, yes. Uh negative 5 t squared, and so t is equal to not root 2, but root 4 is 2 seconds. Alright, so that's the time to drop, and now, go to the second part, I have x is equal to vx times t. I know t, and I know x, and so I'm looking for vx. It's equal to x divided by t, which is 3 over 2. 1.5 meters per second. So we worked this problem in class, but, you know, we were looking for something different. We were looking for the x range when we worked it in class. And um, in this one, we're looking for the initial velocity. You understand what I'm saying by this? That we'll see these putative problems. And number two, it not, it's probably not going to be a canon, but I'll ask you a question that just asks the range. But then you'll see some other questions that will be similar to the problems we worked in class, but not identical. But you'll need to really know the problems, how to work from the procedure, and be able to sort of flip around the procedure a little bit and get to the answers that we're in need. They're not different problems. They're still the same scenario. It's just asking for a different thing. All right? You got to know it too well. You know that right. Well, you got to know it whole. You got to know it really well. But you can do that. Yeah. It takes practice. Every single one of you is capable of doing this. You wouldn't be in the class if you weren't. And honestly, like, y'all are the best students I can. And y'all are like the best of the best because you come on Friday at 3 to the health center. <laughs> Who does that? Right? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, let's look at some others. Um, yeah. Yeah. All of the following apply. The maximum height occurs at the midpoint of the flight. Eh, let's see. So, yes, this is the midpoint. It occurs there. The time of flight to half the maximum is equal to one quarter the total time of flight. Hmm, I'm not so sure about that. Are you sure about that? Is that true? Yeah, yeah let's, what's it saying is that the, the time to get to this point is the same. Like I have a t here is equal to the time to get to the next point. 
that it's split equally into four separate parts. Not sure about that. Let's skip it. The path is a parabola. Eh, yeah, that's true. And the maximum range occurs when the launch angle is 45 yeah. degrees. That's so true. Yeah, so B is the right answer. But then we also know that, um, and we've seen this with this problem when it goes up and then up again, that it actually gets to halfway point in a shorter amount of time because it's going faster, right? Going up in the first half than it does to get up to the next half because it's slowed down in that second half. So the time to get, I'll call this T1 and I'll call this T2. T2 is actually bigger than T1 because it's slowed down in that portion. That's true, right? Isn't that true? Makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. So B is the right answer. That's a good question, huh? Oh, what about number five? I remember when I gave this question. People sort of freaked out just a little bit. Uh, stone is thrown horizontally. The direction of the velocity at point Y is shown by which of these vectors? What would be the velocity at point X? Which of these vectors would be the velocity at point X? A would be right. Very good. Because the velocity is all in that direction. But at point Y, you have a velocity vector in that direction and you have a velocity vector in that direction. And so the, the resultant vector is going to be in that direction, which is which of these? Uh, that's B. See? I got this, right? What would Z be? Uh, no, Z would still be B. Yeah. Uh, never do you have a vertical velocity vector. Unless you straight drop it. Yeah, I mean, if, but then that's not projectile motion, right? So if you just drop it, then it would have a vertical velocity. Very good, Ross. All right, a uh, basketball is shot from a free throw range at the top of its trajectory, its acceleration. Huh. What is this acceleration? You're right. B is right. There is no acceleration in the x direction. And at every point in the trajectory, it has the acceleration due to gravity. You know, a lot of times people will think, oh, it's zero, because I know at the top that the velocity in the y direction is equal to zero. But that's not true. Just because the velocity goes to zero doesn't mean the acceleration goes to zero. The acceleration is always that minus 10 in the y direction. In the x direction, it's always zero. OK. Um, any of these others stand out to you? Or we could look at some other tests if you want. You want to look at another test? OK. I'm, I'm going to actually let you all out at quarter of after go home. My son has a dance, like a middle school dance tonight. <laughs> I mean, I'll, it's all the same. All the boys on one side, all the girls on the other. <laughs> I really made. I remember something. Someone made a roast up for for someone. I said his teeth are like a middle school dance. All the boys on one side, all the girls on another, on the other. I can't remember who it was. But it was... I'm saying is it's all it's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um. Let's see. Let's look at this number one. This is the fall 16 exam. I just want to show it because uh, it's a little bit different, right? It's a little bit different from ones that we've had. So I want to know the magnitude of the ball's initial velocity. And look, don't try to go through and figure out all the different permutations that I can have because there are so many that you would just drive yourself crazy. But Practicing will help. So go through and practice different types of problems, and you'll find those in the exams. Uh, I have, it's this problem. I have an angle of 30 degrees, and I know that it travels this distance in one second. It travels a distance of 8.67 meters in a time equal to one second. And I want to know the magnitude of the ball's initial velocity. Hmm, how would I go about this? Well, since I know the x range and the time, I can find vx. Because I know that vx is equal to x divided by t. 
if you recall, this comes back to x is equal to v naught x times t. v naught x is equal to x divided by t. But remember, bless you, that v x is equal to v naught x. So v x is equal to x divided by t, or 8.67 meters per second. But that's not what we're asking. Now, you might be inclined to put b, but that would not be right. Because I'm actually looking for the ball's initial velocity. And so in order to find that, I need to recognize that Vx is V0 cosine of theta. And I'm solving for V0. 8.67 divided by cosine of 30. Uh, it has to be 10, right? Yeah, 10 meters per second. I knew that because it's the only one that's bigger than 8.67. That I know that my initial velocity has to be bigger than this value, so that gets rid of all of these and just leaves me with 10. Okay? But the student that doesn't really know what's going on or that hasn't read it carefully, they're probably going to put 8.67 for this answer because they'll just, you know, do this first step and then forget about the other. Um, all right. These are all well. Number one, number one is it looks complicated, but it's actually one of the easiest problems on this page. How would you go about it? Huh? Oh. Just what? Right. A hundred times what? Right. 86.6, right? All right, because I'm just looking for uh, the velocity in the x direction, which is the same as my initial velocity in the x direction. You know, number three is like the one that we worked initially where I'm looking for the horizontal distance. It's identical to the one that we worked initially, like that's on your open stacks. And similarly here, number four is identical to the problem where we're just looking for this range. I can work through those if you want. You want me to? Or you want to look at some others? Yeah, of course. Oh, don't forget your graphs, too, okay? So you need your graphs. There won't be as many as you had in the last one. But yeah, so we're going to get to friction soon. Are those in the uh, book? Yeah, of course. All right, number 15. Let's look at 15, and then we'll look at uh, 16. Uh, number 15, it says a 500 newton force is required to accelerate a car from rest, zero, to 3.9 meters per second in 12 seconds. That's when I know the mass. This is my force is equal to 500 newtons. Uh, if I want to know the mass, I know that that's uh, F over A. I know the force, so I just need to find the acceleration. That's where our kinematics comes in. I say that V is equal to V naught plus AT. V is zero. So it just goes away. And I'm looking for A. So A is equal to V divided by T. It's three point V or a U or that's a V, man. Three point nine divided. No, I mean the one a B. This is an A. A is V over T. Right, 3.9 divided by 12. Uh, that's 0.33 meters per second squared. 0.325. Yeah, but I kept two sig figs there. And so I've got um, 500 over 0.33. 1500. Well, let's look at this though. So a woman weighs 700 newtons, sort of typical, steps on 
to a scale that is in an elevator and it begins to accelerate and now the woman weighs 500 newtons. This goes back to our, our uh, problem that we did today where we have a block. Did we do this? Yeah, the block in the elevator. And in our problem, I forget how much the block weighed. Let's call the lady the block. Let's say that this has a mass of 70 kilograms. That's the mass of the woman, uh, right? Because her weight is 700 newtons and FW is equal to M times G. So if her, or if her weight is 700 newtons, her mass is 70 kilograms. 70 times 10 is 700. Now, if she's going down, then the tension in the rope is going to be less than 700 newtons. If she's going up, then the tension in the rope is going to be more than 700 newtons. The same applies if she's standing on a scale. Because scales just, they measure the normal force. We haven't gotten to normal forces yet, but it's a reaction force to our weight. Uh, they don't actually measure your weight directly. They measure another force that's equal to your weight. But if you're accelerating up or down, then that force is going to be different from your weight. Just same as the tension. So just sort of think about it in terms of tension. So here, if I wanted to know, instead of what is, I want to know what is the tension, basically. And that's going to be 500 newtons, in this case, because it says... It, 16, yeah. You want me to write it over in 16? Does that help? Yes. All right, so my tension, which is the same as our normal force. I'm sorry, we haven't got the normal force yet, so y'all might know what that means, but you probably don't. But just think of it in terms of tension. Our tension is equal to 500 newtons. Our acceleration, we don't know. And the mass is equal to 70 kilograms. But I know that since she weighs less, or she appears to weigh less, that she's going what? Up or down? She's going down. She's going down. So I can get rid of these. So I know that the acceleration is downward. Now, if I draw my forces, I have my tension here and my weight here. If I apply Newton's second law, sum of the forces equals MA. That is FT minus FW equals mass times acceleration. So I'm looking for A. That's FT minus FW over M. That's going to be 500 minus 700 over 70. 200 over 70, it's about 3, 2.9 meters per second squared. But notice that this comes out to be negative 2.9. And that's how you know that it's downward instead of upward. So wait, we took, so basically we took the tension, subtracted we subtract the weight from the tension, and then we divide the whole thing by the mass. Right. But again, don't... How do we get the mass? Oh, the mass is 70 kilograms. Because I know that the weight is 700 newtons. That's given right here. It's equal to the mass times G, which is 10 meters per second squared. And so M is equal to 70 kilograms. Don't worry, that'll sort of become second nature to you. If I give you a weight, which sometimes I do... Then to find the mass, you divide it by 10. Sometimes I give you the mass. And then to find the weight, which you need to know the weight too, then you, you multiply it times 10. Just make sure you read carefully. Is he giving me the mass or the weight? It'll be different for different problems. I'll do both. Okay, you'll have a problem similar to that. And uh, I said so you don't know what normal forces are just yet, but this is very similar to the elevator problem that we worked today. Uh, I don't want to get into friction today. That's sort of a whole new thing. Yeah, I want to work this problem. You'll get a little preview of what we're going to do next week. Okay. It says a five. These are the hardest problems. A uh, five kilogram mass is pulled up a smooth incline at a constant speed. That means that the acceleration is equal to zero. The rope is parallel with the surface of the incline, and the incline is 50 degrees relative to the horizontal. And the tension in the rope, I want to know what is the tension in the rope. All right, so the first step on these is to draw our forces. I have a force weight. 
I have a normal force. Let me go ahead and describe what the normal force is. The normal force, if I push on a surface, the normal force is the opposite force that pushes back. We'll get into Newton's third law, but Newton's third law says that if I have an action force, that is a force that you're pushing on something, then I have an equal and opposite reaction force. So for example, if I have an object here that has a weight equal to 10 newtons, then there's going to be a normal force that's equal to 10 newtons. That's why I say your scale, your bathroom scale, doesn't read your weight, it reads your normal force. And that's okay if you're standing in a non-accelerating elevator or just in your room, or if you're standing not on an inclined plane, then the normal force is equal to your weight. But if you're in an elevator that's going really fast, or if you're on an inclined plane, not equal to your weight anymore. Okay? So don't try to weigh yourself in an accelerating elevator or on an inclined plane. Or on a different planet, because then that would be different too. Especially not on Jupiter. Don't go to Jupiter. Stars be crushed up, be crushed like, like yeah. a little blank I mean, piece. Jupiter doesn't really have a surface, so you can't stand on the surface of Jupiter. I mean, eventually, if you get far enough deep into the, the planet. Five minutes, five minutes, like I said, five minutes, you're just going to be crushed like a little... Yeah, you'd be crushed and dead, and, you know. Wait, it's supposed to be like 50 or so... <laughs> isn't the gravity right? It's like 50 or so tons? Something like that. It's a lot more. Okay, so, our, and then we also have the tension. I'm going to call this FT, uh, normal force tension and the weight. I'm going to draw a coordinate system. We'll talk about this next week, but my coordinate system will look like that. It's rotated. I'm going to redraw my coordinate system over here. Listen, if you're not getting this, that's okay. We're going to cover it in class, but I just want to give you a flavor for what we're going to be doing. This is our normal force. Just redrawing my forces so that I've rotated it back. And then this is my weight. And now it becomes a lot like the problem that we did today in class with the ropes. This angle is 40 degrees. If this angle is 50 degrees, this angle is 90 minus 50. That will always be the case with inclined planes. I will always give you this angle, and you'll always need this angle. So it'll be 90 minus the incline angle. I find my... Uh, resolve my vectors. This is going to be FW cosine 40, FW sine of 40, and then I write my second law. I say the sum of the forces in the x direction is FW cosine 40 minus FT, and that's equal to zero, but it's only zero because this is equal to zero, because it's moving at a constant speed. It's not accelerating. What are we supposed to put for the 3FW for the cosine? Well, we're not quite there yet, so we'll just, uh, let's just write up. How do we know it's zero? Well, we know that this is actually equal to MAX, the mass times the acceleration in the x direction, but AX is equal to zero, so this whole thing is equal to zero. Then we do the sum of the forces in the y direction. That's FN minus FW sine 40, and that's also equal to zero. All right, now we're looking for the tension. So it turns out all that we have to do is solve this for the tension. The tension is equal to FW cosine 40, which is equal to uh, FW is 5 times 10, because the mass is 5 kilograms times the cosine of 40, and then that's your answer. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so it's 38 newtons. A is the right answer. The 5 and the 10, the mass is 5 kilograms, and so the weight is 5 times 10. That's M times G. Right, that's G. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of that. It'll become second nature to you, okay?
in like in like twenty years. No, not in twenty years. In about a week and a half. Or whenever we have our exhibition. But it takes practice. Listen, I understand. I told you I'm taking Hebrew, and man, it is it's tough. Like I think it's harder than physics. Because just all the symbols are just foreign to me. But I know that's true for y'all too. But as you spend more time with it, as you work through these problems, and for me too, it's becoming easier. I'm beginning to understand the letters and read the words. But as you work, spend more time with this, it will become easier to for you. Trust Okay? But it takes time. Okay, FW is the weight of the object. Oh, okay. And then We'll do this. All right, y'all have a great day. Uh, anybody come in late? I don't think anybody did. What's our next exam? I don't know, does anybody know when the next exam is?